Welcome back to The Mining Pod. Today in the show, I'm joined by Ryan Condrone, CEO of Titan Pool. We talk about revenue strategies for small pools, building a trustless hash rate marketplace, and why every large miner should run their own pool. The future of digital asset mining calls for top technical talent. Enhance your ASIC education with Foundry's hands-on courses. Led by veteran industry instructors, Foundry's three-day mining intensive and five-day mining technician academy programs cover a range of topics, from identifying issues and troubleshooting common hardware failures to coursework covering Bitcoin's global impact. Open to enthusiasts and professionals alike, visit www.foundryacademy.com to learn more and sign up for the course that's right for you. Brian, welcome to the Mining Pod. I've been meaning to have you on for a while. I think the first time we we talked was at I think it was Bitcoin Miami this year, 2022. I saw you on stage, and I was like, oh, "I got to get him on the pod. He's eloquent." Uh, and now we're here. You know, the, when we talked then, you could have come on and shilled how great Bitcoin is, and now I have to have you on and talk about how bearish everything is. So you kind of played yourself there a bit. But again, welcome to the pod. You know, thank you. Uh, it's, it's good to be on. Uh, you know, mining in a bear market is a, just as exciting as mining in a bull market. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we have to be uh, resilient. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I like the perspective of the fairly least. Okay, we'll start off with a little introduction on yourself and Titan Pool, what you guys are up to. Uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. Yourself and Titan Pool. Yeah. Uh, so, we uh, we run a pool called Titan uh, Titan uh, We launched it about two years ago in kind of testing phase, doing a lot of internal testing and benchmarking. We've had some of the world's largest miners benchmark the pool, and uh, we're really happy with the, the results. Um, the the overall strategy with the pool is we we have the the main pool at Titan as kind of a flagship pool. The goal was never to grow it into this massive public pool. Um, our mantra at Titan is really every large miner should be running their own pool. Um, they should be signing their own blocks. They should be processing transactions on the network. Um, that's you know that that's what we think decentralization is. Not just uh, distributed hash rate, but decentralized hash rate is the large miners running their own pools. So we use the main pool at Titan as kind of a flagship pool. We encourage miners to jump in mine against the pool it's a zero percent fee fpps um, so we're very competitive um, it's highly optimized and and we do our best to just do a white glove onboarding into that um, as we scale the relationship and as uh, the miners and our clients uh, start scaling the operations and we start having the discussion of hey uh, now's a now's a good time for you to roll out your own pool uh, so we we help them set up their own uh, ADR AWS account or cloud hosting account, and then we can deploy all of our pool infrastructure into the account. And now they're signing their own blocks. They're they're mining against the network, and they get their own street cred as uh, they get to sign that Coinbase. Cool. So the the pool part, I was actually planning on talking about that a little bit later in the podcast, but you know, brought it up now, so might as well jump right into it. Titan Pool has about one point four exahash uh, submitted to it, and that's been growing over the last few weeks, which is awesome. Congrats to you guys. I am curious about the growth plans for a smaller pool, however. And I, I think we've seen the playbook actually implemented successfully over the last two years, especially with the China ban, where we saw Luxor, Foundry, and some of these other America or North American-based pools actually grow quite significantly. I'm wondering, is Titan Pool sort of thinking like the same way, like marketing to American miners, trying to onboard them? Or are you guys more focused on that software as a service, like pool software as a service, and giving that over to like large companies that are wanting to run their own pool? So, you know, originally when we entered the pool market, um, that was kind of the vision was uh, interfacing with uh, US based miners, um, having this KYC AML uh, trusted pool, like invite only pool, and growing that. Um, as we started seeing more hash rate flow into the U.S., and we started realizing, okay, U.S. is going to be a hash rate leader uh, in the world for the foreseeable future. Um, having a narrow approach of just growing a pool um, doesn't really help the network. It doesn't really help the ecosystem and where we're currently at, um, where you have the top three pools really control the majority of the blocks. Um, so we had to shift our vision a little bit and just realize, you know, what's what's the end vision? What's the the end goal here? And really, the end goal is better pool software and more block producers. 
Um, and that's really where we shifted to. Um, so uh, starting out, you know, wanting to work in the U.S. space and really focus on U.S. miners uh, was was the original vision. And, and now we're, we're really kind of uh, dovetailing off that and, and trying to build a more private pool ecosystem. Okay, awesome. Well, let's turn over to some of the products that you guys are working on. I know you guys are working on a hash product that enables you to like sell hash rate to the marketplace. And it's a Web3 product first. So it uses smart contracts and uses chains as opposed to other services that are trying to do it just by like with uh, OTC desks where you're just like kind of talking to a third party and they're uh, creating a market between two other participants. Tell me a little bit about that product. Uh, I know there's some like news coming up on it. I won't steal your thunder, but interested interested to know about the product uh, at the very least and how you guys are designing that. Yeah, uh, definitely. So we're working on a, a network called Lumeran. Uh, we launched the the token about a year ago now, and the the goal of Lumeran is really this decentralized data routing. Um, where we use a smart contract to broker the the stream of data from a sender to a receiver. And it's completely data agnostic. So it can really be used for any type of uh, socket or data stream. Uh, Since we are in the the world of pools and mining and and Bitcoin, we really wanted to focus on hash rate. And what did that look like if we were going to be routing hash rate through a smart contract? Um, And what could we do with that? Um, and the first kind of flagship idea, the, the um, test product, if you will, is this idea of the Lumeran marketplace, this idea where you can create um, hash rate contracts, post them up for sale on the marketplace, and then a buyer can come along, purchase the contract. Uh, their uh, payment actually gets locked up in escrow in the smart contract. And then the seller's node actually opens a socket directly to the buyer's node and streams the product they purchased. So if they purchased, you know, a hundred terahashes over the next twenty-four hours, then the node is going to open up a socket to the buyer and it's going to stream a hundred terahashes over the next twenty-four hours. Um, and as it does that, it receives the payment through the smart contract. And uh, buyer and seller don't need to know each other; they don't need to trust each other. Um, it's completely. Uh, global, anonymous, and decentralized. Um, so, you know, once in place, this is actually going to be the the first uh, truly uh, digital commodity uh, where you can buy it and sell it and actually take delivery of it, um, which we, we haven't seen that before. So let's dig into the, the product a little bit more because I'm curious about this, having like an Ethereum background myself. Mm-hmm. What chain is this on is this on the the chain that the token you're referencing here it's its own chain that other people are going to have to like download nodes and run it on and then that thing is securing itself so, is so eventually, another chain? eventually yes so eventually we'll have a merge mine chain with bitcoin um that will it will have all its own transactions and its own smart contract ecosystem and everything um for the initial rollout uh so the the test if you will will all be on top of ethereum um, the scalability on top of Ethereum is going to be difficult just because the transaction fees. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're actually stocking a lot of the hash rate in the marketplace initially ourselves um, to front the cost of transaction fees and just really show that the ecosystem can work. Um, the goal is to migrate the entire ecosystem onto our own chain uh, where we can where we can uh, control transaction fees and we can control a lot of the environmental elements. Gotcha. Now, another question that comes to mind almost immediately is like, it's a pretty eloquent system to use a smart contract because it enables like execution flawlessly, you know, just tell it to do something, give it an input with a key and you get an output with a hash rate. The issue that a lot of people have come across with these things is how enforceable they are, however. So like if I've committed to giving 100 pentahash or something like that onto this contract and then Bitcoin's price goes up, and the value of that hash rate becomes more significant, I can essentially like rug pull my hash rate and not point it at the contract like I'm supposed to. And there's some products like out like that out there right now that are trying to fix that enforceability part of the contract by putting up like slashable Bitcoin that you can put on chain. So like if you are participating and then you decide not to give your hash rate when you're supposed to, your balance gets slashed, things of that nature. Curious what you guys have come up with in order to like fix that problem, which has seemingly persisted for quite a while. The initial marketplace is going to be very short periods of time. 
Um, so short amount of trust, like short periods of trust, right? So uh, right now it's 24, 48 hours. Um, as these contracts build a reputation of being fulfilled and not canceled, uh, then they'll be able to go for longer periods of time. Uh, so uh, the sellers aren't just going to, at least this is the Lumeran marketplace, right? Anyone can fork the, the marketplace. They could launch their own marketplace using the Lumeran nodes. Um, this is really just kind of our proof of concept. Um, so for the Lumeran marketplace, it's going to be short periods of time. As you gain reputation uh, with completed orders in the contract, then it can be longer and longer periods of time. That doesn't necessarily solve the, that rug pull scenario. Just because you have a good reputation doesn't mean you can't just decide you, you don't want to do it anymore. Um, so there, there is a, a risk there where you can front uh, you know, a year's worth of contract payments. And then all of a sudden, the, the difficulty drops, the exchange rate goes up, and, and now the miner doesn't want to sell their hash rate anymore. Um, so there, there are some ideas we've tossed around of uh, the seller actually posting a stake, um, basically committing to being a good actor. And if at any point that they you know, become a bad actor, a provable bad actor by not fulfilling the contract, uh, then you know, reverting some of that stake to the buyer um, as compensation. A lot of these models for long-term hash rate contracts, um, we're really going to be leaning on other members of the community and other members of the ecosystem to help help solve these problems. Um, you know, we have some ideas. We've talked to a few other groups and developers that have ideas on how to handle it as well. Uh, probably the staking and the slashing is probably the best uh, approach we have at this point. Um, but open open to other models. At the end of the day, like what we're building with Lumeran is that proxy routing uh, system that takes its orders off of smart contracts. Um, whoever wants to, you know, fork, copy, and uh, you know, deploy their own ecosystem with their own set of rules is more than welcome to do so. Yeah, it's certainly an interesting model, an interesting problem. Talking about the community aspect, there, I'm curious about this. So, Bitcoin miners, not necessarily Bitcoin maximalists, like they're not one of the same groups. Oftentimes you find a Bitcoin miner who's running, you know, a lot of different mining apparatuses in their in their mining facility. Uh, there are some out there who are just, you know, pure play Bitcoin maximalists. What has been Titan's reception for this sort of product when it comes to Bitcoiners in general? Since for the most part, Bitcoin miners are all Bitcoiners. So, that's a great question. So people love the idea. They love the idea of a hash rate marketplace. Um, at the end of the day, it's you know, miners are profit-driven animals, right? They're they're uh, told that they can buy this little toaster, and if they plug it in, they're going to get a certain amount uh, of money per day, right? Um, so you show that to a person with a lot of money, and the response is, "How many toasters can I have, and where can I put them, and who's going to keep them online?" Uh, so now we have warehouses and data centers popping up all over the world with you know tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of these you know little heat and noise generators. And people are trying to keep them online. And now they're like, okay, well, I'm creating all this hash rate. I want to get paid. Um, the, the vision is really creating this global marketplace for getting the highest profitability possible uh, for the miners. They're, at the end of the day, they're a utility um, that they're creating a product that is uh, decentralized and global and can be sold anonymously. Um, so the reception to the, the hash rate marketplace has been incredible. You know, we have some of the largest miners on earth, you know, waiting for it. Um, we've had um, just a, a great feedback on that side of it. Um, the fact that it's paired with a token gives people pause, right? Um, so talking about Bitcoin maximalists, where Bitcoin is the, the, the true and only cryptocurrency and decentralized ledger and everything else is just complete crap. Um, you know, that's... <laughs> You know, it's it's hard to uh, it's hard to navigate that sometimes. Um, at the end of the day, you know, we have a very uh, utility specific chain, and and we're we're trying to fulfill a very specific utility of routing data through you know a a peer to peer uh, data routing system that is referencing in a Ethereum virtual machine or a smart contract engine. To know how to route things, right? This is a this is a very specialized uh, system. Uh, we often call it a layer zero system because it's it's really just routing everything else for all the other layers. Um, the goal is not to have it sit on top of anything else, but actually route the data for everything else. Um, 
I even talked to, you know, the guys at Zcash about, you know, a way of doing anonymous block routing. So, you know, one of the, the last ways to identify a node is through its IP address and block propagation. But if you shroud the block propagation through another network like Lumerin, then you could truly have an anonymous, uh, you know, node. So there, there's things like that. There's there's other utility for um, the Lumerin node other than just hash rate routing, um, where uh, having a network token to uh, help broker the the transactions to help put a little bit of friction in the state update um, is is really needed. So. I'd say the reception of the hash rate marketplace has been very good. Uh, people get a little weird too about the fact that we're we're launching a Bitcoin hash rate marketplace on Ethereum. Uh, that that weirds people out a little bit. Uh, they because then they're just like, wait, you know, they they want to be Bitcoin maxi and they want to support it, but at the same time, it's like it's it's violating this idea of you know, oh wait, it's on another ecosystem. Um, but for for the most part, it's uh, I, I think I think the token has been the hardest one to to uh, explain to people the need for it. Um, people just don't realize the immense amount of data that can transact on a network, and if you don't put friction in there, uh, then you'll never really come to consensus on a ledger because people are just shoving so much data so quick onto these um, onto these chains. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah, that that product in general has just been kind of the holy grail for a while. And I've spoken to a few teams, even on this podcast, about them building it. And the architectures, they, I'm sure on a technical level, and for someone who knows as much more than I do, they're quite different. But when I talk to people, they're, they kind of come to some, some of the similar ideas where they need a smart contract, they need some more functionality, and they often need a token to make a hot hash rate market work, especially yep. one that's like, you know, has no custodian. custodian. Uh, so that design seems similar. I am always interested by the Bitcoin maxi reaction to these things because a hash rate marketplace would necessarily make life easier for a lot of Bitcoin miners who have this extremely volatile revenue. And then their costs are also lately pretty extreme, but costs typically yeah. like you can sort of track those a little bit more easily. And you know, you want to be able to sell your hash rate somewhere else. So it's a it's a great product, but we've only seen a few products launch so far and I haven't seen like a ton of adoption from them. Yeah, the so the the hardest thing is is just understanding like the the model that miners are going through right now. Because uh, you know, if I showed you a power producer, a power plant, and I said their business model is to generate electricity. And by the way, they only get paid if they use all the electricity they generate. You just think like that's that's kind of a crazy business model. You mean they're they're generating electricity and trying to use the electricity at the same time in order to make a profit? Well, now the problem is now they're both they're beholden to the the price of electricity and what they can actually get paid for for the electricity, and and you know how how much electricity is actually even worth uh, when they use it, rather than offloading that risk to someone else that's going to use the electricity. So a, a power provider staying as a utility is. It's the best business model. And we really see that being the same for miners. Miners really should be a utility at the end of the day is where they're they're creating hash rate and their goal is to sell the hash rate and let someone else use it. Let someone else mine blocks with it. Let someone else, you know, route it and, you know, back networks and do whatever. Um, you know, it's you don't see AWS, you know, the whole business model on creating data centers to use all of the compute power. They They sell off the compute power. Um, so that's that's really where we think uh, sustainability for the ecosystem um, moving into the future is going to be is through this idea of a hash rate marketplace where all the miners just basically funnel their hash rate onto this global hash rate grid, if you will. And then uh, purchasers, whether it be financial institutions or governments or individuals, uh, purchase hash rate then to um, process blocks and transactions. Yeah, a trustless way to buy like a bundled hash rate future spot product would be pretty slick. And I think it'd make a lot of miners lives better. Let's move over to the mining pool itself though, and kind of return to the beginning of the conversation, talking about what Titan pool has been up to, how you guys onboard people. The thing I'm always curious about with smaller pools and you guys are 19th, I think is the numbers you guys put out. I think we're 16th October. as of today. So yeah, 16th, we're, there we go. We're, we're climbing Love the that. ladder. Yeah. We're getting there. Yeah, climbing the ladder. I, I have appreciated seeing a lot of teams over the last two years put in the hard work and have the market swing in their favor as well. Uh, as I mentioned a second ago with the China ban, 
they've been able to you know get into significant territory with hash rate and Titan Pool seems to be on a similar trajectory and journey. So I'm curious though, what does that path look like from a strategic perspective? What are you guys doing to in the, in order to gain more hash rate? You mentioned talking to some of the larger miners out there, developing software for them. You have this vision of every large miner should run their own pool. Uh, if you could just break that down for me, then I have a few more specific questions afterwards. Oh, like BD strategy is is hard. You know, it's uh, you ask someone, you know, years ago, you know, why are you on Facebook? And they're going to say they're on Facebook because everyone else is on Facebook, um, you know, and and you get that network effect. Right. Um, and slowly people started migrating to Instagram and <laughs> Facebook bought Instagram. Uh, people started migrating to TikTok um, and who knows what the next platform is going to be. But um, this idea of network effect seems to be migratory. Um, so why is everyone? Why are all these large miners mining against Foundry? Well, zero percent fee FPPS, and everyone else is mining against Foundry. Uh, why are why are a lot of international miners mining against Ant Pool, um, Slush Pool, F Two Pool? It's it's just because that's where everyone else is mining. Um, the reality is is to run an FPPS pool uh, that's zero percent fee is incredibly risky. Um, if you have a bad luck run. Uh, you empty your reserve and you can't afford to pay out um, every 24 hours at that point. So miners want to reduce their risk. They want to get paid out every 24 hours. So they want this idea of an FP, FPPS pool, which basically pays them regardless if the pool finds a block or not. Um, but then, you know, with Foundry, uh, we're, we're competing at a, at a space where everyone wants a 0% fee or very close to it. Um, some pools have kind of drawn the line and said we're we're not reducing their fees, and they have uh, enough, I guess, momentum behind them where they can do that. Uh, I know like Luxor, Slush, F two Pool, they they've been very you know hard lined about their fees, and it it somewhat works for them. Um, but then they got their lunch got eaten by Foundry essentially, right? They, when they're offering something for free. I don't know how long that model is going to last, um, but that's that's the competition we're dealing with here. Um, so the best we can do is be completely transparent. We can show people exactly what we built, that we're proud of it. We can show them the benchmarks that my, you know the miners around the world have done against the pool, um, and we can compete on the fee level and say, well, zero percent fee FPPS. But that's as a as a public pool is not a very sustainable model because we're basically just giving it away for free. Um, so our sales cycle is more or less, as I said earlier, um, hey, come come in our pool, uh, get to know us, uh, get to know the software. And once you're comfortable with that and you scale as a miner and you're over an exahash in hashing power, then let's have the conversation about you running your own pool. Um, it, it's, it's good for the network. Um, it's good for you know signing your own blocks, decentralization of block creation. Um, it's good for your own data. Like for example, you know, right now, uh, how much is a public mining company's data worth to them? If they're mining against a public pool, that pool has all of their data and knows what their profit and their forecasts are a, a lot of times before the actual miner does, right? So, you know, given profitability calculations, obviously anyone can kind of take a look at the hash rate and do the calculation. But, um, you know, the, the pools are a very intimate partner um, with the miner. And so especially the publicly traded miners need to take that very, very seriously, not just jump at a pool that, you know, cheap fee, but, you know, this is where your revenue is coming from. You know, can you pick up the phone and call these guys on a weekend and they're going to help you if something goes down? Um, so it's that type of relationship that we offer at Titan. Um, we're a pretty small shop and you can, you know, our clients can literally pick up the phone and call me. You know, on a weekend, we jump on a call, we make sure we resolve whatever issues there might be, um, you know, and that's that's what we can do as a smaller pool. Um, now, is that scalable as a, as a public pool? Uh, probably not. When you have like, you know, 10,000 clients and you're trying to take phone calls on the weekend, probably not a good idea. Um, but our goal is to is service mid to large miners, um, provide really good white glove service. And the goal is to get them using their own pool. Um, and then to just to wrap that up, Tybo, around it, the, the pool interaction with us when it comes to a private pool is actually really simple. It's a month to month. It's a simple flat fee. So we're not taking a portion of your, your profits and in, 
you know, in ratio, it's you pay the flat fee from month to month. You're not under contract. You use us why you know why you like us, and it's our job to to earn your business on a month to month basis. And then then we work with you on customizations, on report generation, um, white labeling. Uh, it's it's really a more of a SaaS service at that point. Okay, I want to play devil's advocate because okay. I I can, and I want to see what you got. <laughs> uh, what we saw this last summer was a few public companies try to go that pool model where they run their own pool. Mm-hmm. And that succeeded in some cases. I think Marathon Pool would be a good example of that. And they're large enough where they can make their own pool. They can run that successfully. They're more than likely white labeling someone else's solution, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, At the end yeah, of the day, they yeah. purchase it and they're running it. They are. That's good to confirm. Through, through, I think DMG is uh, DMG. the Marathon Pool. Yep. Yeah, and so, and so we've seen that be one instance of a success, right? They have enough hash rate under their own management to run a pool and not risk uh, being unlucky for a month and having no Bitcoin for whatever reason. Just how it happens. On the other hand, we saw some other pools. I think Argo is the most specific example of this, and I believe it was this summer. I can't remember which month exactly, but it was in one of their public updates where they're running their own pool or they're working with another public company to run a pool. And they were very unlucky and it hurt their underlying revenue quite a lot. And then you run a tail risk with that, right? Where you get pub- punished in the public markets. So I guess I pitch the question back to you at what percentage of the network or what exa hash value does it really become feasible or safe to be running your own pool? And you mentioned one exa hash there, but in my mind's eye, it might be okay for one month, but like, what if you have an unlucky period and then you really put your business at risk? Yeah, and that's when you run your own pool, you're you're stepping into the seat of this the FPPS pool model, where essentially you need to pay yourself out, um, you know, regardless if you find a block or not. Um, that, that's a huge risk, and for the smaller miners, that risk is a lot greater because you don't know if there's you know a software issue or a a submission issue uh, until it, it could be too late. You sunk too much cost in electricity, and you went without a block for a couple of weeks. Um, so as you grow in hash rate, the, the risk becomes a lot less, um, you know, you could go, you know, one to two days without a block, but you know, you'll, you'll catch it pretty quick if there's something wrong. Um, that being said, statistically, it shouldn't matter. Um, you should be able to mine with, you know, a hundred petahash or one exahash, the, the same amount over time. And statistically, your luck should always be 100%, right? If you're, if you're running everything with optimally in your facility, um, your luck should always land long-term around 100%. Uh, the goal is to essentially survive the, the, the luck oscillations, right? So we even have a formula that uh, we've been passing back and forth, even with some other pools of like, hey, um, there's, a, there's a big talk right now about proof of reserve. Um, we want to show and be completely transparent about how much Bitcoin is actually backing our pool. So if you go to pool.titan.io, one of the first things you'll see is our reserve. You'll be able to actually see how much Bitcoin is sitting in our wallet and is backing the pool. Um, to my knowledge, there's no other pool that does that. Um, and I don't know if that's uh, for for reason, you know, a good reason or not. But um, every pool, you know, if you're trusting them with your hash rate, you need to know how much Bitcoin is backing that FPPS payout, right? So as hash rate goes up, it's um, it's less risky, but over time, statistically, it should be 100% as long as you, you have enough Bitcoin in reserve to, to sustain the, the, the luck oscillations. Now, the luck oscillations are going to um, increase and magnify the more hash rate you have. Um, so if you have, you know, an exa hash online, you're going to need, you know, a hundred, you know, just throwing out a number. Uh, I haven't run this through the formula, but, you know, say, you know, a hundred Bitcoin in your reserve to withstand the ups and downs of luck. Um, whereas if you're running, you know, five, uh, exa hash, maybe you need 500 Bitcoin to withstand the ups and downs of luck. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the idea is you're going to be a hundred percent, um, on the luck factor, uh, you know, within a year. Um, so that's theoretically, like statistically, that's the way it should average out. Um, if Argo went into, uh, you know, being a publicly traded miner and they went into having their own pool, um, they really need to run their own reserve. They need to treat that pool as it's going to be an FPPS payout, paying them out every 24 hours. 
but they need to make sure that they stock the reserve with enough Bitcoin to, you know, to level out their books every 24 hours. So they, they act like that reserve, that 500 Bitcoin or whatever they put into the reserve is the investment into the pool. And then they look at the FPPS payouts every 24 hours. So they run the reports, their accounting, um, all of their revenue statements, everything are going to go towards that. Um, I mean, that's, that's the model that, you know, we think is best, you know, granted, you know, if they want to run it differently, that's, you know, that's up to them, how they're going to show what blocks they find and all that, all that to be said, um, that is the risk, right? So, and, and so the eventual model and back to Lumeron, and this is where it dovetails with Lumeron is, uh, if a large miner doesn't want to take that risk, then the model should be that they are a utility. They sell off their hash rate to this global hash rate grid. Um, and then pools or whoever wants to run a pool is actually bidding against other pools to buy hash rate off of the hash rate grid, right? So, um, you know, Argo, preferably, you know, they want the, the highest profitability and the lowest risk. They're going to put all their hash rate um, through this global marketplace and then let other people mine with it, let other people take that risk. And then they get their steady payout um, as a publicly traded company. It looks like you know what you're talking about, so I won't press any more on that question. I mean, Nailed it. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, I, I'm great at sounding like I know what I'm talking about, but um, yeah, no, I, I think it's fair. Like it just comes down to statistics, right? Uh, and that one instance for Argo seemed to be an anomaly, and I'm not calling them out on purpose. It's just like a very easy example. Like they're a public company, yeah, and like it happens, you know. You know and yeah. our, our pool went, I think, like 350 percent. Uh, so, so we, our, our pool does reverse. So we, we call it effort rather than luck. Mm -hmm. So yeah. why some pools say they had, you know, oh, they're sitting at 103% luck, 110% luck. Um, the, the high numbers for us are bad, um, because we're, we're looking at effort. How much effort are we putting into finding a block? And, you know, we had a, uh, we had a dry spell because we had really low hash rate and our, our, uh, effort on one of our blocks was like 350%. So that means we should have found three and a half blocks in the time that we found one block. Um, so, I mean, essentially we paid out uh, 21 Bitcoin for getting to get six Bitcoin. Um, so that's, that's painful. That's not sustainable. Um, you know, since then, like, and then we followed up after that where we had a 13% effort block. We had a 50% effort block and 80% effort block. So then our luck oscillated the other way and it, it balanced out. Um, but we had to be able to survive paying out 21 Bitcoin to only get six back um, because right at that, that, that threshold, when we're paying out our 21st Bitcoin, if our reserve can't handle that, we go bankrupt, you know? Um, so that's, that's the risk. That's the risk that these FPPS pools make. Um, now, the smaller pools, uh, and kind of going back to your other question too, um, how do smaller pools survive in this? It's it's really hard. You have to be able to invest in yourself. You have to be able to have a reserve to handle that risk oscillation. And then as we bring on a large client, um, so for example, we're in the process of bringing on a, a few large clients. Um, so our hash rate went from you know 150 to 200 petahashes, uh, swung up to about 2.4 exahashes over the weekend, and it's just going to keep climbing. But our, our risk in going, uh, going bankrupt, if we don't have enough in our reserve, uh, gets exponentially worse. So we need to be basically be on standby to keep stocking Bitcoin into our reserve to make sure that, that we can make that FPPS payout every 24 hours, um, knowing that over time, our luck is going to um, average out at 100%. So that's actually a great follow up to my or a great segue, I should say, to the next point of the conversation, which is like maintaining revenue lines, especially during a bear market. And before we dive into that specifically for what Titan Pool is doing in this instance, do you guys pull on like lenders to be able to have Bitcoin on tap if need be? Like, how do you guys keep credit lines open in order to like keep that reserve stocked up? I mean, I think that's something that <laughs> people have speculated about Foundry and Genesis yeah. working together. Uh, yeah. but for you guys who are a little bit separate from any credit entity, I would assume you just have to have a relationship. So, so for us, um, we are in-house funded. So we, um, you know, we, we are very fortunate to have a relationship with block as our parent company, um, that have, you know, they've done really well in the space with some of their products. Um, so they backed us early on. Um, we raised our, we did our own equity raise a seed round, um, 
at the end of 2020, 2021, um, Coinbase Ventures was actually one of the first into our seed round. So we, we had some really great support early on. Um, so we're self-funding the pool. So we make sure that we have enough kind of in our coffers to keep upping our reserve as needed and as we need to scale the pool. And this was, you know, this is one of those things of planning ahead, right? Um, this was uh, outside of the bear market. I mean, the, the bear market hurts everyone. Um, we made sure that we had a lot of our holdings just in USD because we knew that um, regardless of if Bitcoin goes up or down, like we're going to need to be able to sustain what's going to happen. Um, so it's it's treasury management at this point. You know, I was on, I was on the panel uh, back at, in Texas just last week, I think it was, where, you know, the first panel, we were talking about treasury management. Um, at the end of the day, we're running businesses. We're running a small business here. Miners are running a small business. Pools are running a small business. And we have to treat it like that. We have to realize that we have we have obligations to both our employees and to our customers to make sure that we're financially sound. And we don't, we don't bet the farm on, you know, holding assets in a certain way that might be deemed risky. So we set our treasury management uh, principles that we're going to hold this much Bitcoin, we're going to hold this much cash. Um, and as we need to, we'll, we'll move cash into Bitcoin or Bitcoin into cash to make sure that our treasury risk stays acceptable. Um, and that's that's running that's running a small business, making sure that our opex stays low, um, that we have a good um, you know runway in front of us, and that that we stay online. Um, you know, a, a, a lot can be said for some of the larger miners that that didn't operate like that, that that went like you know super bullish and said we're just going to hold Bitcoin and we're never going to sell a thing. Um, but then they just started borrowing money. That's like, that's equivalent to the guy taking out the second mortgage on his house to invest in Bitcoin at 65,000. You know, it's, it's, it's speculative and it's incredibly risky. And it was amazing for the person that took the second mortgage out on their house and they invested in Bitcoin at 3000 in 2020. Um, but it did not work out for the, you know, the guy that did the same thing a year later, you know? Yeah but they're they're both taking a risk and they're both speculating on it and you know i'm running i'm running a company here i can't take that risk i can't speculate i have to make sure that uh people stay employed and clients stay serviced so um, i would encourage miners to do the same thing to treat their operation as a business and to make sure that they have the right runway to make sure that they're not speculating um to take acceptable risk um at the end of the day, unless your employee is getting paid out in Bitcoin, regardless of price, um, you're going to need to hold some USD. A candid warning that that may be too late, Ryan. Uh, there's a lot of people who are not doing so well right now. So you know, let's get it, your go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. Actually, I you know like I I have you know I have friends that work at a lot of these you know yeah. uh, companies. Um, you know, some of our former employees have actually moved over and work work at some of these companies. Um, so it, it's hard to watch, you know, um, we're, we're all we're all tied in together in this ecosystem. It's still a very small ecosystem, all things considered, and, and mining even more so. Uh, when we go to these uh, mining conferences, it's guys that we've been working shoulder to shoulder with for years now, um, and we're, we're scaling together. And um, so, sometimes we just have lessons that, you know, we need to learn in this industry that have already been learned in other industries. You know, it's, uh, we're still very, very new here. Um, and a lot, honestly, um, a lot of the, the, the leaders in the space, a lot of the CEOs and heads of these companies are very, very new, including myself to leading yeah. companies of this size. Um, you know, we, we found ourselves in the right place at the right time, uh, doing the right thing. And, you know, we scaled because of it and we, we raised a lot of money. We're making a lot of money. Um, and we're, we're, we were doing really, really well. And now we're, you know, getting hit by the, the two by four of bear market <laughs> across the face. Right. And, um, thankfully I've been through this a few times before. So I, I, you know, you can kind of see the, see it coming. Um, so it's, <laughs> I, I don't know what more to say about it. It's, you know, we're, we're secular or secular, secular. I, I can't even say it. We're, we're going cycles. We go in cycles. Yeah. You can, you can edit that out. Right. Um, you know, we're, we, we go in cycles here and uh, we're, we're just doing it again. Uh, we're, we're probably going to go in the cycle right up through uh, the, the happening again. And 
we'll probably see an upswing uh, in September after the happening, just like we saw last time and the time before that and the time before that. Because we're, we're in the cycle and we, we, see the, we see the same thing historically. I saw the same thing in 2013 where we saw um, the market peak right around end of November, Thanksgiving time, right? Um, we saw, I think, $1,200 Bitcoin in 2013. And I was like freaking out because um, I, hadn't, I hadn't really bought any. I had been mining, but I hadn't bought more Bitcoin. And I thought, oh, I, I missed my chance. The market came down and I, I bought at $900 uh, in December. And I was, I was like, okay, at least I got in. And then the market kept dropping, right? Right through 2014. And I'm just like, what did I do? Like I, I, I put like all this money into, into Bitcoin, um, I'm, you know, I'm working as a low end software engineer at a startup and, you know, I'm thinking I did the most terrible decision ever. I've only been doing, you know, Bitcoin stuff for maybe a year and a half, uh, at this point. Um, and it was hobby, you know, I, I'm running, uh, GPUs in my garage. I'm, you know, I, I'm buying S threes and, and sticking them in the addition of my house. You know, I'm, you know, this is, this is a, this is a hobby. Uh, but you know, the, the technology is sound, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, I'll, I'll point this out every once in a while, like, uh, and it's, it's probably happened since, but the, the one that like reminds me, you know, I always think of is, you know, a couple years back, someone moved a billion dollars or just over a billion dollars from one Bitcoin account to another Bitcoin account. Um, the transaction went through for about $700 in transaction fees. No one knew who did the movement. I mean, someone, some people speculated that it was like an exchange rebalancing their books or whatever. Uh, but honestly, no one, you know, no one in the general public or, you know, most people looking at the chain knew who made the movement of $1 billion from one address or one custodian to another custodian for $700. It was settled within 30 minutes, um, trustlessly settled, anonymously settled globally in 30 minutes for $700. I can't think of another service on the face of the earth that could move a move billion dollars anonymously with no government getting involved, no bank getting involved. And that's Bitcoin. You know, at the end of the day, that technology still exists. And when I bought Bitcoin at $900 and it dropped back down to $150 and I'm freaking out, it didn't matter because at the end of the day, that technology was the same. And that technology is desperately needed when we have governments reaching into people's bank accounts, when we have uh, uh, banks reaching into people's bank accounts and freezing assets. Uh, when I have anyone that I write an ACH check to can take my routing number and my bank account number and can reach into my bank account and take money. When we're in this type of a ridiculously stupid system, like we need Bitcoin. We need, we need these decentralized ledgers that are trustless, that are not issued by governments, that are not um, you know, controlled by just local fraudulent banking institutions that want to take your money, lock it up, and then lend it out and give you shit interest. Like, I'm sorry, like this system is is awful, you know? And at the end of the day, like we need to have Bitcoin. And, and people are waking up to it in droves. And just because we have some investors and some large institutions that are playing games with you know, OTC services and, and dumping large amounts of Bitcoin on news and rebuying it up, at the end of the day, we see Visa coming into the space. We see Shell coming into the space. We see all these large companies um, waking up. And they're the ones that are running the infrastructure. They're the ones running the financial services. And now they're getting into the space. If that's not like a buy indicator, I've never heard one. I don't think we can top that, that Michael Saylor S. Grant at the end there. <laughs> so we'll have to close it there. Ryan, thank you so much for joining the Mining Pod. I appreciate learning. I learned a lot about like the, the statistics on that and then like how you guys are building that hash rate uh, marketplace as well. So appreciate your time greatly. Cool. Thanks for having me on. It's been fun. <laughs>